Boy, I am sick of cables. I've got a whole drawer at home that is packed to the gills with every version of USB from 1 to 3 and A to C and various lengths, of course. And I've also got a ton of proprietary connectors. Man, no idea what that one's for anymore. (laughs) Wouldn't it be great if everything was just wireless already? I'm definitely going with Bluetooth for my next design. I know, I know, I hear you. Bluetooth has a checkered past for many of us. We were traumatized by spending hours trying to get stuff to pair and then talking on the phone with our brand new headset and then the music player takes over and our mom gets an earful of that one song. (laughs) Oops. But Bluetooth has come a very long way since then. Range has gone up, power has gone down, bandwidth has increased, and there's even mesh. Adding Bluetooth to your next design is not just smart, it's practically expected at this point. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today we're going to look at a bunch of cool solutions that make it easy to add the latest Bluetooth capabilities to your next design. My guest is Mark Beecham from Silicon Labs, and we're going to do an overview of Bluetooth capabilities and solutions that will help you ditch those cables in your next design once and for all. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about Bluetooth solutions from Silicon Labs. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. Glad to be here. So Bluetooth is taking center stage in this episode of Chalk Talk, but there have been so many advances in the world of Bluetooth lately, I'm not sure exactly where we stand today. So Mark, can you walk me through all of the different specifications and applications you're seeing today? Absolutely, you're correct. There's been a lot of advances in Bluetooth since Classic, so we've come a long way. The SAM of applications that Bluetooth can cover has grown so much, so I just want to kind of go through it and break it down on where we stand, and depending on what device you're making, you care about some of these new features that have recently been added. So starting with one of the bigger updates since Classic was Bluetooth 4, and I think the big one here was Bluetooth Low Energy. So before, Bluetooth was pretty limited to audio. That's kind of where Classic found its home. But when Bluetooth Low Energy came out, it really changed how it could be used. You're able to sleep longer, wake up faster, have the connection for a shorter amount of time. And we're talking orders of magnitude here. So the battery life that you're saving is incredible here. And it really opened up a lot of applications, especially those on a coin cell. So this was released in 2010, 2011. And it's not a coincidence that right after that, one of the really popular Bluetooth tags came out that, you know, you put on your keys so you can never lose it. That application was really only opened up because of BLE. And so now all these other battery powered applications on Bluetooth, like uh, fitness wearables, really have exploded since that release. So then Bluetooth kind of had that, it went quiet for a little bit. And then a big update with Bluetooth 5 came in 2016. And so this added three new features. One is double the data rate or double the throughput by adding a two megabits per second phi. And there's two good use cases for this new feature. I put agricultural here, but really um, it encompasses anything that takes a lot of data throughout the day. So if you have something like an environmental weather station uh, that's taken, you know, soil temperature, moisture, sunlight, wind, all that stuff, and it's just collecting it and collecting it all day. And then it connects maybe once a day or maybe once a week and just dumps all of its data. Having more throughput means that takes a short amount of time, which is very useful. Another big thing, which doesn't really have a specific application, is the -the over-the-air update impact of this. So I don't know about you, but I bought a Bluetooth-connected home device recently, and the first thing it does when you power it up and connect it to your phone is this fetching update. And you just kind of sit there for a while and wait for it to be done. And so I think to improve the consumer use case of that, because no one wants to sit there with their new device while it updates, you can send that firmware image a lot faster with that new Phi setting. The next thing that it offered was four times the range. So we have these lower sensitivity, lower throughput settings now with Bluetooth 5. And one of the limitations with Bluetooth, I'm sure in the early days we've all experienced this, is if you're walking from you know, the corner room in your home to a different room or maybe the garage even, you're going to lose your headphones or it's going to cut out. And this really solves that. And it also helps with penetration here. So every building layout is a bit different. And building automation has been relying on different protocols because of the penetration and the range you get. Now, with this Bluetooth 5 update, we're seeing a lot of building automation applications come up trying to use Bluetooth, uh, like smoke detectors, can finally have the range to talk to whatever hub or gateway is across the building. That was a big update. And then eight times the configuration. So this one's a little nuanced. It added a lot more channels 
and it added a lot more data that you could advertise. And the big application for this is beacons. So instead of making a connection, you could broadcast a lot more data. You could do more data without setting up a connection. So if you wanted to send, you know, who I am, where I am, temperature, uh, you didn't have to establish a connection. You could just now blast it out via advertisement and get that. And so that actually amplified a lot of these tags as well as industrial automation kind of beaconing. So that's Bluetooth 5. And then kind of like Bluetooth 4 to 4.2, there's been incremental updates within it. So 5.1 was the next one. And the big thing that was added here was direction finding. And this is called a angle of departure or angle of arrival, or if it's both, it's called AOX. And this is big in a lot of ways and very exciting for a lot of applications. One of the big ones would be asset tracking. So if you have some material good or package that you want to track throughout either your factory or your shipping house, you can know exactly where it is, where it went through, you know, so if it gets lost, like, hey, no, I have the tags right here. Another, you could say cool application, but also maybe a little scary application is, you know, we all have phones in our pockets. And if you're in a shop in a big department store, they can have these basically beacons that sit up top and kind of track where you are, what shelves you're looking at the longest, where customers spend most of their time and try to offer you a better experience. The pros of the connected world, kind of the cons of the connected world in terms of privacy, but it is an exciting update there. Next, we're looking at uh, Bluetooth 5.2. And this actually went back to some of the audio features and tried to enhance it. And the cool thing here is it's called asynchronous channels. And so there's two cool use cases for this. One is, I don't know if you've ever had this, but you have your earbuds on and the audio gets slightly out of sync. It's happened to me a few times and it's just a little bit, but it's noticeable. Now with this, you can transmit data. It more tightly controls the timing of parallel connections. And so that's good for either earbuds or two sets of headphones. And you know, one use case that's really neat is, say you and your spouse want to you know, watch some TV late at night, but your children are asleep, you don't want to wake them up. Well, your smart TV can now connect to two headphones, synchronize the audio data, and you can watch you know, your favorite show that way with this new feature. So that's pretty exciting there. Now, Bluetooth isn't the only protocol. I don't want to say there's competing protocols for Bluetooth, but there's others that are out there. Uh, and there's others on the same band or on different bands. So there's also 2.4 gigahertz proprietary. And this is good if you own both points. And the paradigm example of this is a wireless mouse. You know, the wireless mouse company ships the mouse with the little USB dongle. They know exactly what data is going to be sent. They know their battery life target, all that stuff. So they control both. They don't really need to follow a standard. They kind of just made their own. The volumes dictated it. So that can be a good choice for applications like that. Then you have sub gigahertz. So it's on a different band. And the benefit to sub gig is just power and penetration, right? It goes a lot further, penetrates a lot further. Uh, and the good example, of this is a garage door opener, right? I want to be able to open my garage door when I turn the corner on my street, not when I'm 10 meters away. So that's been sub gigahertz for almost its entire lifetime. And then I don't want to turn this into a BT mesh discussion, but BT mesh is surely a very exciting update that we've been working on. And so the big application for this is smart home light bulbs. And the reason for that is, all the mesh protocols that are out there today have, I would say, one big limitation, and that's accessibility. They're all kind of a closed system to the user. So if I install all the light bulbs on one of the popular mesh protocols, it has to go through a gateway. It has to go through something to transform it either to the cloud so that I could get it on my phone or to Bluetooth so I could connect to it on my phone. BT Mesh is trying to solve that. It's trying to bring accessibility into the mesh world. And so it's very exciting. Uh, we're seeing a lot of light bulb customers trying to get this going just because it does offer that huge advantage. Yeah, I've heard about that as well. So if I'm looking to get started on my own Bluetooth design, what kind of solutions does Silicon Labs offer? So we have, I would say, two big types of solutions. And one is, you know, the easier gateway starting point, which would be the modules. And the others are kind of the more embedded intensive solutions, uh, the SOCs or system on chip. We'll start with the easier to use parts on the modules. So these are pre-certified. You have all the bomb components on there that you need to just set up a connection. And these are great for low volume applications or if you have limited development time, you can just bolt this on. You know, in the early days of Bluetooth, modules really took off because people were just bolting modules onto their smoke detectors or in their industrial process to track it. So it's very easy to get started. We offer a really easy to use API. So they come in two flavors. One is a PCB module. So it's all the components soldered down to a PCB with the antenna on it as well, shielded and pre-certified. So you can just plop that down. We also offer it in system and package, otherwise known as a SIP. 
kind of looks like a QFN package almost, and it's all of the components you need in a much more compact form. Some are in die form as well, just to save space. Uh, and so if you have a really space limited application, like if you were making a smart outlet, space gets pretty tight in there, you know, if you have with all your switching components and you don't want big Bluetooth module taking up too much space. So the SIP may be a great solution for that. So that's kind of the entry point there, I would say. And now if you wanted to do, you know, a full on development for a Bluetooth design, especially if you're getting in high volumes or you're ultra space constrained, we have the SOCs. And the SOCs come in two different generations. The first generation we call series one, and those are the two on the left. And then we have our next generation where the first two are right there. We're, you know, in the middle of this generation on series two, rolling out more and more as time goes on. So when you look at generation one, like the BG12 or the BG13, these are full feature, big, powerful MCUs with a really strong radio on it as well. So these have high output power, 20 dBm. Um, they can support Bluetooth and sub gigahertz. And so what's cool about that is, you know, garage doors, like I mentioned, have been proprietary sub gigahertz for so long. Now customers and users, right? I would love to be in another room and say, hey, wait, did I forget to close my garage door and pull up my phone and check? But to do that, I'm going to need a Bluetooth connection to my garage door, which is sub gigahertz proprietary, so that's not going to happen. But with this chip, you can now offer that. If you put this on the garage door, you could still open it from down the street and the user could still use it and, you know, within the house range to check if the doors open or close. So that's a really cool feature. And it's the multi-protocol aspect of the Series 1 devices are a big strong point of them. Also, the range you get with the 20 dBm is nice. And even on the older generation, you know, what's nice about what we did on Series 1 is the hardware is so beefy that when Bluetooth 5 came out and all these new features are coming out, we're able to support the long range or the 2 meg phi on them because the hardware was capable. You kind of need both pieces there for it to work. Then when you look at the Series 2 devices, the 2.1 and the 2.2, you know, these are a bit more surgical on their applications. So 2.1 is our BLE mesh mains powered chip. And with those two together, that screams light bulbs, right? So this is all about BLE mesh light bulbs. You don't need to focus on low power as much. You got the mains power there. If you're going to do or make a BLE mesh connected light bulb, the 2.1 is the optimal solution for that. And then we have the 2.2, which is a bit more cost optimized, low power for those asset tags, tracking, beaconing, and things like that. Even blood glucose meters, if you wanted to add Bluetooth connection to your blood glucose meter, you know, this would be a great cost optimized solution to do that. Now note, there is a proprietary logo next to the BG22, but it doesn't support sub gig. It only supports 2.4 gig proprietary. So this is kind of the lay of the land for Silicon Labs' Bluetooth solutions and kind of what the strengths of each of them are and why you would use one over the other, depending on what's important to you or depending on what application you're making. Sure, that makes sense. Now, Mark, beyond Bluetooth SOCs, lately I've been hearing a lot about Bluetooth 5 and Bluetooth Mesh. So do you guys have solutions in this area as well? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, so for Bluetooth Mesh, we were the first vendor to announce support for it. And for Bluetooth 5, we were one of the first to announce support for it. So we follow the SIG very closely. And, you know, we have a large team that's continually watching these new features and getting support for them as they come out. And so, you know, the Silicon Labs mentality is we like to solve really hard problems, especially those problems that no one else can solve. And so we've really done that with multi-protocol. So Bluetooth plus Zigbee or proprietary Bluetooth, really anything switched, dynamic multi-protocol, commissioning, whatever it may be, you know, we've developed our software and our hardware to be the leader in that space. And we want to also take that into Bluetooth 5 and into Bluetooth Mesh. So Bluetooth Mesh, just by being a mesh network in general, is very difficult. You need a lot of software to support it, and we're trying to provide that. So we'll talk about that a bit later on. But we also understand that these things are a bit more difficult to get into at times, which is why we offer the Bluetooth modules as kind of a gateway. You can use a BG API, which is a very simple API to get you know, your Bluetooth connection established. We even have wire replacement devices called the BGX. So we kind of want to offer the entire range of the type of, I guess, familiarity that you have with Bluetooth and go from just starting it on a new design to I've been an embedded Bluetooth developer for five years and I'm ready to take on mesh. So Mark, a Bluetooth solution is a lot more than just a piece of silicon, right? What does the rest of the Silicon Labs Bluetooth ecosystem look like? We're finding that out more and more is that, uh, you know, I'm a hardware guy. I could sit here and talk about the silicon and the specs all day, but, it, you know, software usability and tools are becoming a much larger piece of the puzzle here. And so what we're trying to do to attack that is 
offer a variety of ways to get started. You know, we have our full featured wireless development kits with multiple boards, multiple radio attachment boards, so you could really hone in your network and the performance. We also offer, you know, simpler, lower cost kits just to get started, see if it's right for you. And so that's kind of from the accessibility side. And then on the tools and ease of use, we offer the free IDE network analyzer. We have iOS and Android apps with the source code. We have the energy profiler tool, which allows you to see your current consumption in real time. We want to remove any obstacle in the development process when you're getting started with Bluetooth or even, you know, going from design to design on Bluetooth. And I would say, you know, the most important part of this is the hardware and the software have to be there to support whatever it is that you want to do. And Silicon Labs has our own in-house developed stacks that we continually update that we put a lot of effort into. And I would just say the breadth of feature support of our hardware and our software are pretty extensive. So let's talk a bit more about the software. Great. Let's do that. Now, can we dig into the software side of things? I know that connectivity is an important part and can be kind of tricky in software, right? Correct. And so, you know, if you just look at all the Bluetooth features, there's a lot of different levels of what can be done, what features you need to do certain, you know, long range or low energy, things like that. And we've tried to just cover our software support to just cover a large range to hit all of these aspects. You know, if you want to do mesh, you're going to need the mesh features within the Bluetooth stack, which we can support. If you need to work with Apple HomeKit, that's something that we offer as well. If you need coexistence, that's a feature that we've built in. The time that the embedded person is spending on software is just growing. There's just more from the top cloud level all the way down. And so we're just trying to offer as many features so you don't get surprised down the road that, oh, your stack doesn't support this. So therefore, you know, I can't take advantage of the new 2 meg five. So now I can't get the throughput that I need and this kind of ruins everything. So with the in-house develop stack that's constantly updated and you can even request new features if there's something that you know we don't offer, we always have the system to just continually feed in new features to our software stack. Excellent. Well, Mark, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about Silicon Labs Bluetooth solutions. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.